Okay, everybody, we're going to start. Uh, this is uh, expectations versus reality, which is pretty much what we're all writing about. Uh, if we can get a handle on reality, that'd be great. And we have this fabulous panel with a lot of recent, uh, with a lot of award winners and some of them quite recent. So we're going to start right here with Kat Jackson, and they're all going to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Kat. I have not won any awards, so that was not about me. Um, <laughs> I am by default an educator and also now a writer. My fifth book is coming out in May, six is coming out in October, and I publish with Bella. Um, I really like M dashes and semicolons. And um, thank you. Yes, love punctuation. Um, and I hate mowing the lawn. Okay. I'm Kate Haddock Strong, and I've published five books with Bella, and I'm a founding member of the Sapphic Lit pop up. Thank you. And then we'll go to uh, Nan. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nan, and I've released my debut novel in September, The Rules of Forever. Uh, my second book is coming out in April, which is very exciting. And I'm from New York City, Upper East Side. Hold on a second. Nan, did you forget something? Uh, I was shortlisted for a Lammy last week. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Aurora Ray. Um, <clears throat> I work as a college dean during the day um, and write the rest of the time. Although it has recently been brought to my attention that I collect projects and may be addicted to side hustles. Um, it is all in the quest to leave the day job completely. Um, I just signed a contract for my 18th book, and I don't know how to do the math to like how many are because it's very hard to keep track. But um, yeah, that's, that's wait, me. Wait a second, Aurora. Did you forget something as well? I, I was also shortlisted last week for a link. Hi, I'm Morgan Lee Miller. I'm from Washington, D.C. I have six books with BSB, and I'm about to turn in my seventh in like two weeks. So yay. Yay. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to ask everybody the same question to start. And that question is, and I'm going to start with you, Kat. Uh, what did you dream of being when you were a kid? Oh, um, uh, good, great question. I did not dream about being a writer until that I was, was about... my next question. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, answer the question that's asked. Okay. Um, I dreamed about being a teacher, which I became, and I regret it every single day of my life. Um, mm -mm. um, if you're in education, you would understand at this point in time. Uh, and, but I also dreamed of being an interior designer, which never happened. Okay. Thanks. And what about you? Um, I guess, uh, um, probably a ski racer. Good. That's great. Thank you. And, uh, Nan, what about you? Um, I wanted to be Laura Holt in Remington Steel. I, I wanted to be a private investigator and drive around in a white uh, convertible Volkswagen. Uh, that did not happen, though. <laughs> I wanted to be lots of things, um, but probably mostly a chef. A chef, great. I don't know if this is boring or cool, but I always wanted to be a writer. So, well, that <laughs> I'm going to stick with you for a minute. Uh, when you were a kid. Did you know what a writer did? I mean, were you the kind of kid that went to the library and you got out the books and you were sitting, you know, all that kind of stuff? No, I didn't read until like college. So I don't, <laughs> I'm really confused. Is um, that when you learned to read? Our, our <laughs> educational system college. sucks, man. <laughs> Pay good tuition money for that. Um, no, I was I was five and I had a dream about this blue hippo named Hippie and I wrote it and it was a bestseller with my mom. So <laughs> and <laughs> there you go. been writing since. So hand it to your pal next to you here. What about you in terms of uh, juvenile writing? Were you five? Were you six? Yeah, I remember writing a story about an alien in like my third grade, like gifted and talented, like program. And I like drew it. It was purple. They're always the things, graphic novels right? at that point. Like it was. Yeah. But I think yeah. like I actually spent way more time, especially like in college, sitting in coffee shops with a notebook, imagining myself a writer that any writing and then I learned like you can't be a writer if you don't actually like well write. that's the name of this that's the name of this panel imagination okay 
I remember when I was, I guess, 10 or 11, uh, my family lived near the beach. So we would go to the beach in the summertime. And I had this composition notebook that I wrote this very involved story about a group of kids who rode Huffy Thunder Road bicycles, because that's what I wanted really bad. And I forced my my little sisters to read it and they still remember it. So, well, <laughs> there's longevity good there. Good for you. And Kat, what about you? What's the question? I don't remember. I don't either. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about this when you were a kid? Nothing. Okay, done. That was question number one. Um, Do you want me to answer that question? Did I ask for him? Yeah. <laughs> I thought so. I thought I was supposed to talk about your, writing your, as your a youth, child. As your, yeah, I want to hear about your youthful writing. Yes, my youthful writings. Um, well, I my mom is a reading specialist, so I've been reading, or she was, she's retired. Um, so I was brought up in books, essentially, and um, I read voraciously to the point where I started reading Danielle Steele books when I was maybe like 10. I stole them off my mom's shelf, so that paved the way. Um, I didn't start writing until I was about, I don't know, 12, and my dad called it fluff, so then I stopped writing until I was about 27. Oh, yeah. 27. He meant okay. well. All right. <laughs> yeah, childhood. Yeah. So I didn't write stories as a kid, but I used to send really long letters to my family and friends. And they always sort of remember that. So it was more like through letter writing about my experiences. Cool. OK, so we have all uh, grown up writers on the panel now. Um, so what I want to ask next is, were you aware of or surprised by the realities of becoming a writer? Because um, you all started very young and now you're here. And so let me start with you, Morgan, because you uh, always wanted to be a writer. So when you became one, were you surprised by it or did you did you know what you were getting into? For the most part, I knew what I was getting into, but the one thing I was kind of shocked by is how the relationship with writing changed. So it became like this awesome, fun thing I would do and like in high school and college and I would abandon my friends and like go home and like write under the covers. It was like a, I was closeted uh, writer. Um, and then when I started publishing it became less of like this, this is gonna, I'm, I need to choose my words wisely. No, you it was less of, now it's like less fun, but it's still fun. It's more of like, this is a job now. So there's a difference between a hobby and a job. So now it has formed into a job and I really wasn't expecting that, well, but what, it's a fun job. But it's still different. What, what's fun about it? Well, you get to create your whole, you get to create a whole new world and kind of escape your own reality. And then people are reading your stories and then coming up to you saying how much they love your characters. And it's just kind of surreal every time. Doesn't matter how many books you've published. It's so surreal when people are like, oh, I really love this story. It's really yeah. And it's not just like a secret word document on your computer or notebooks sitting on your bed and you like won't let your mom clean under your bed because you don't want her to read any of the stories. Right. Let's just keep it going down this way. Yeah. It's really funny that you say that because I think the reality of like job versus hobby is true, but like in the opposite way for me as someone who has recently discovered she's addicted to side hustles, like writing like it was my job, being contractually obligated to submit my um, and like seeing my words out there, like that, that's what makes it fun. Like the fact that it like it has an end game. Um, and it's not just for me and it's not just this like little secret thing. It's this out. I mean, I still get super awkward in public spheres, but it is really cool to interact with readers and kind of know that it's out in the world. Uh, Kat, I understand the whole education and not being psyched about being a teacher. I'm a recovering teacher. Yeah. Um, uh, I haven't been teaching for about two years and the one thing that I did like about teaching was when I had to proctor an exam, I would just go off into my own head. And that's when I'd be thinking about my book and when I wanted to be writing. Um, so I knew that, you know, what I was doing for my day job wasn't really what I wanted to be doing. And so the reality that now for the time being, I'm able to do that is just amazing. Awesome. That's great. Let me go to you this time, Kate. Okay, in terms of things I was surprised by, um, the biggest thing for me is the writing community. 
I never knew it existed. And the author relationships I've developed are just something I, I could never have imagined. And it has been so incredible. I think what surprised me is, um, well, I, virtually everything, but how it has changed me, I guess, in the way that I approach things in my life. I am not a disciplined person by nature, but because I now have due dates and expectations and obligations with something that's actually a side job, it's not my full-time job. I've had to become more disciplined in every area of my life and I don't love it, but I guess it's um, good growth. You don't love what? I don't love the discipline. The discipline part of writing. No, no, I'm I'm super. I'm an extremely undisciplined writer. Like really. Bad. So, so what do you have to do to get to the love part? This, this sounds like foreplay or something. I don't know. Or therapy. <laughs> um, I have to, as as far as writing, like as writing. Yeah, like mm. you said, you don't love the discipline. So I'm wondering, wh where do you get to a point where you at least like what you're doing or maybe even love do, what you're doing. I do love what I'm doing, yeah, okay. but it sometimes it feels too, too heavy, I think. Um, and that might just be because of the book that I'm currently writing. So I have to get into a headspace where I'm willing to be hurt um, by what I'm writing. And I'm not really willing to do that all the time. So Wait, this is really interesting. Do you mean emotionally hurt? <laughs> Yes, I'm or, not or physically mean, hurting myself. <laughs> but or or do you mean hurt by the people you're writing about? Um, I I'm hurting them. That's what I meant. Yeah. Are you hurting the people you're writing about, or okay. are you emotionally? Yes. You know? So the problem is, I have a very strong emotional attachment to what I'm writing right now. So it's hurting me to be putting the characters through what I myself have That's experienced. Perfect. Wow. That, are we good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> she's done. All right. Can you top that? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, this is a therapeutic question now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you did go. Who did Do I you hurt yourself through else writing? Now? So, so, <laughs> all right. I told you you got to keep an eye on me. Okay. Um, you may not agree that that writing can be sort of, or the, or getting your book published can be also a kind of disheartening experience. Okay. I don't know whether you agree with me, uh, agree with that or not, but um, Morgan, why don't you tell us what what not not about the process of your writing, but the process of getting your book out there in the public? Are are there things that were just and I really want to use that word disheartening that kind of made you kind of heart sick? Yes, I in college I spent every summer working on query letters, and I was pitching to agents, and I had a nice collection of rejection letters, and. I like the first one was really exciting. And then after for like four years of getting rejected, you're like, mm. um, so I took a break. Like I didn't write, which was really weird because I've been writing my whole life. And so not to have two years of writing, like was really odd. Like I didn't really feel like myself in that time. Um, so that part was disheartening. Um, but then I got published with BSB and what is the disheartening stuff? Um, Hmm. I don't can know. I, can I help I, you with I that? Feel, I feel pressure right now because I'm the first well, one to answer. No, but what I, I want, you said something about agents. Okay. Yes. Now I know a lot of They're folks scary. in here don't have agents, but your experience with getting an agent, it strikes me that that would be an interesting topic for disheartening. It was very disheartening. Yeah. Uh, uh, I had like about 50 of them. Um, and it, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a lot to like, even think that you're at this space to put your book out there. And so like when you query the, uh, the agent, it's really fun. I mean, I thought it was really fun and exciting. Um, and some of it, it was just, some of it was like good feedback of ways I can improve it. But other times it was just a no. And after a while, and I'm also fragile. So after a while it was maybe I'm not cut out for this. And so I think that's why I gave up and I didn't give up. I took a break. Um, and then I realized I was queer. I'm like, Oh, I can write these stories now. So it was exciting again, but oh, interesting. I don't know if I answered the question. No, you absolutely did. And I just Aurora, anything disheartening? Yeah, no, I never put myself through the ringer of, um, querying agents. Um, wait a second. Hold on. You never queried an agent. No. Then you've never been disheartened. <laughs> <laughs> no disheartening. Um, 
I mean, I think I went through a lot of struggle. I have um, both my bachelor's and master's degrees are in English. Um, and I went through a real, like, I think struggle and coming out of the closet. It's way easier to come out of the closet as queer when like you're in higher ed and you're in academia and you're an English major than to come out of the closet as a romance writer. Um, and so I think if I had to think about disheartening, like that's actually one of those that like, I can get on the soapbox and say the romance industry keeps the lights on. It is the like bottom dollar of the entire publishing industry, whether it's, you know, indie or traditional or small press. Um, but I still sort of felt myself kind of flinch inwardly and feel not good enough about it. And I think there are still moments of like, there are people who are judgmental. There are people who are homophobic um, and publishing books. When you put them out there, you get bad reviews. It is a business. And so a book that you might be extra proud of kind of tanks in terms of sales, even like my modest kind of regular sales, a book will do really badly. So I think there's like that kind of stuff can so, be really so disheartening. The, the, to make sure I understand so the romance thing is harder than coming out as queer. And, I mean, not, why is that exactly though? Not now. I mean, I think as someone who did uh, uh, an advanced degree in English literature, who did a lot mm -hmm. of like literary theory, who sort of was in circles with college faculty, college administrators, right. there's so much elitism in that. Oh, and okay. there's a whole lot of judgment on genre fiction. Okay. Um, so I think even now, you know, I, I, I joke that when I turned 40, I kind of stopped giving fucks. And I like, it's actually really freeing if you haven't turned 40 yet. Like you stop caring about a lot of stuff that you used to care about. Um, but even now there are moments and there are circles where like people say, oh, you're a writer. That's so cool. What do you write? And I sort of have that like, you know, kind of inner flinch. And it's not about queerness. It's about a genre that a lot of people don't take seriously. Oh, that's fascinating. Interesting. Yeah. Nan, what do you, what do you think? So for this is a little it's not about the writing process or anything, but the thing that is disheartening to me that I've discovered since I've kind of taken this on is uh, I used to be a voracious reader of everybody's work. And since writing, my brain is a little different now. And especially like when I'm trying to meet a deadline, when I try to read something for pleasure, it's my brain is saying you should be writing your own shit. Oh, and um, then when I do try, I'm going to shut up brain. I'm going to read this. My brain goes off on tangents and it starts thinking about what I would be writing. And I could read like four pages and not know when one word has not been absorbed. So my relationship with pl pleasure reading has really changed, but I have a uh, deadline April 1st. And after that, I have a pile like this high and I'm probably going to buy more today. Uh, and I'm just going to read for a month. Not, then I won't have anything in my brain, I hope. That's interesting. I mean, the last panel I, uh, I was on, we talked about what inspires you, right? And we didn't really talk about this, but reading other people's work inspires me. Absolutely. And that's probably true. Maybe we should get on that tangent a little bit because I think it's fabulous to read somebody whose style you really love before you sit down to to write something. I mean, that that style can come inside your body, which is probably not a good thing. But Kate, what do you think about that? Nothing. <laughs> no. Yeah. OK. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, I, ironically, I just made a TikTok about this a couple of weeks ago. I cannot read specifically sapphic romance when I'm writing. I can't do it. I am too paranoid that I'm going to suck something out of that book and accidentally like transferred into mine. So I go through long spells of not reading as well. And it, that's disheartening to me. Um, but I have to talk about the disheartening piece a little bit. I too, like Morgan, am very fragile. Um, and for me, the most disheartening piece of being a writer is this <clears throat> understanding that not everyone is going to get what you're reading. And um, I'm an Enneagram four, if anyone knows about that. And I always feel like I just don't quite fit anywhere. And being a writer has amplified that so much. And that is for me, the single most disheartening thing. Like, no, I want you to get it. I want you to see it from my perspective. And I have to let go of that. And you're always talking about the books, right? Yes. Or, or just... <laughs> or just in life. I really feel like you're not coming at me therapeutically. And I'm like... <laughs> I have a therapist. Like, <laughs> then I shouldn't. Yes. 
very stressful couple of weeks. No, I'm talking yeah. about in life in general. Like that's that's my I'm thing in life. But um, I don't want to stress. No, no, no. It's else. it's fine. But I'm fine. I, unfortunately. <laughs> This is going to sound I'm like fine. a shrinking thing, but no, I, I was interested. I'm also a therapist. Oh, so I, I've got like everything here. Up yeah. Afterwards. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, you did use the word fragile, which mm -hmm. again, I'm serious about this, yep. which seems like a really important word for all of us and for everybody here. I mean, to me that I, I want to just launch into this right now and I'm not going to, you know, call on you, but if you want to talk about it, this idea, this idea that, um, that we're, I believe that we're all fragile people and I want to know if we, I have confirmation on that and how it affects what you're doing. So let me just, is there anybody who wants to talk about that? Oh, you're fragile. I think it's the thick skin versus thin skin, right? Like I can project having a very thick skin in a lot of areas of my life, but the reality is my, my skin is very thin. And especially when I read a review and the first line is it was good enough. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Um, you know, it's just, it's things like that where everyone is entitled to their opinion, but I know for myself, I need to not read other people's opinions of my work. So, so you don't read, you generally don't read the reviews. Oh, I stopped doing that after my first book. Okay. Around the horn here, who doesn't read reviews or who does? Starting with Morgan. I read every review because I want to know what people are saying, um, which is not good. Um, no, I read every review um, and it used to really bother me. I remember the first time I got a one star and I cried. Um, this is a couple years ago. And I was even telling myself, I'm like, you need to shake this off because you're a writer and people are not going to like your stuff and that's going to be okay. Um, I had one book come out that I was like really excited about. And it was, it's like my hit or miss book. Um, and I was pretty bummed about that. Like I just like review after review of people not quite getting it. And I don't know, it really got to me. And I had like this kind of, <laughs> going to be sad and depressing it's like a little depressive sadness for like a month or two I'm like should I not write and um but I continued writing um but that part just like going through that helps because I'm so fragile and sensitive it helps me get used to the criticism um and I mean I love constructive criticisms but some of the things um in the one book kind of added to mental health stigma that I got really extra sensitive to um but after kind of going through that experience, I feel like I'm a lot better with dealing with people who don't like my books and not like, but it, a book that wasn't for them. Um, and I'm kind of now grateful. It's like maybe almost two years out from that book. And I'm kind of grateful that I went through that experience because I toughened up a little bit and I need mm -hmm. to be tough. I can, I can have like thick skin, but still be fragile and sensitive wow, at the same time. Yeah. Aurora, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I read all my reviews too. And it is, you know, good and bad. Some people actually offer like sort of constructive things. And I really value that. I love to learn. I'm like the, I'm that kind of nerd. Um, but like they call it mean reads for a reason, right? There are some people who like, I think really take joy and satisfaction in saying just mean things. Um, so I, I have good days and bad days, right? Sometimes I take it with a grain of salt. And some days I cry on my laptop. And then some days I go and read the one and two star reviews of like Jane Austen and Nora <laughs> Roberts. <laughs> and it really makes me feel better. I, I don't want to be the like schadenfreude person, but like, it's like, okay, really it's true. Like it's impossible for a book to be for everyone. And if, if it, I, I'm almost happier when I get like two and five star reviews instead of like all threes and some fours. Right. Yes. So it's like, okay, it's just, it's not for everyone, but for the people it's for, it's really great. Um, but yeah, like we're, we're just all squishy middle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. Squishy middle. That's fascinating. Nan. Uh, I think I have a much greater appreciation for uh, people who make anything. So I was watching the red carpet of the Academy Awards and somebody said something about somebody's dress not being that attractive. And I'm like, no, don't say that. Somebody worked very hard on that. <laughs> so it's it's across the board now. I mean, you made an excellent sandwich for me. Thank you. Um, but it's weird since this is very new to me. Um, I recently got a really lovely email from somebody just praising my book and telling me how much they enjoyed it. And right after that, I went to Goodreads and read my worst reviews. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, 
I just, maybe it was like, don't get too comfortable. I don't know what it was, but that's the one you remember. That's, that's the one that sticks in your head. So I don't know if there is anyone out there who actually enjoys reading bad reviews and doesn't bother them because I've never met that person. So um, I, I try not to read my reviews. Sometimes I can't help myself, um, but I try not to. Um, but like beta reading, like for my beta readers, I can take pretty harsh criticism because it's constructive criticism. Um, so the two are a little different. She wants to know what a beta. Yeah, sure. Is. So um it, so Nan and I actually beta read for each other. Um, so it's really just when you have a, a finished draft of a story and you share it with other people to get their feedback and really don't share it with your wife or your sister. It really should be people who will give you honest feedback. Before you send it to your editor. Um, does everybody have beta reviews? Everybody does. And they're all useful and I constructive. Don't. You don't? You give them though, right? Yeah, I'm I'm a lone wolf. I You're a lone wolf. <laughs> oh yeah, please. So when I um, published my first book, I couldn't imagine ever sharing my work with other authors or other people. Like they just like terrified me. So now that I have beta readers and I've gone through that, I I mean it's been a big growth for me, but um, it's pretty awesome. So you should try it. <laughs> Enough of that. Okay. Um, did did anybody go into this line of work for the money? <laughs> but I, I actually want to get drilled down on this a little bit. Did again? Let me. Where am I going to start? Let me start with Nan. Did you did you expect to get any money when you started writing? I mean, what? Where was that in your thinking? Because you were a a, a professor, right? Teacher, not a, teacher. a professor, high and school they, teacher. You were a high school teacher and they paid you money once a month or something like that. Okay. They did pay me money, All right. not enough. <laughs> okay, so now, now you're a writer and what was what were you thinking about when you thought about it from that point of view? Well, I money didn't really enter, enter into it in the beginning. My one goal was to try and get it published uh, somehow. So uh, I actually attended the Writing Academy a uh, year-long uh, series of classes where uh, uh, run by GCLS. And it was a really great experience because I found community. That's where I met Cade. And, um, it was a really good, um, support and, uh, a good impetus for me to finish my first work in progress. And I submitted it to BSB. It was my first choice and they accepted it. So that is a, a goal that I have realized. Now the goal changes to, how can I make it viable? How can I make some money off of it? And that's where I'm at now. And if anybody has any tips. Well, let's, <laughs> let's hear it for tips, anybody. Or, 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 or we can chat it, later. It's or, fine. Yeah. <laughs> or or Rory, let, we'll just go down this way. For... Yeah, I mean, I think I too had that goal. Like if you've been a reader your whole life, the prospect of being published, of seeing your name on the cover of a book is sort of, that fuels it a lot. Um, but I think after a book or two, you start to realize, okay, if I'm going to do this on deadline, um, and if I'm going to stomach the bad reviews, like I'd like to make a little bit of money from it. Um, and I think, I mean, I know for me doing it full time is sort of the dream. It, that is not anywhere near my reality right now. Um, but I think, um, trying to be a more productive and prolific writer trying to commit to putting out two books a year, most years like that, that is part of that goal to, to sort of create a backlist, to create kind of a revenue stream that could at least sort of change whether I work full-time or part-time. Um, and so I think that is part of the equation. I don't think it has to be, it's not, um, for everyone, but <clears throat> again, addicted to side hustles. I don't do well with just hobbies apparently. I never expected to make money, um, but I didn't care because I wanted a job where I felt fulfilled. Um, so I work for a nonprofit during the day, which you don't make money for that. Um, and then writing. And I remember when I came out as a writer to my dad, my dad is a mechanical engineer. My mom is a music teacher. So when I told my mom I wanted to study writing, she was like, you do whatever you want. And my dad was like, oh, my God, no. 
Um, but I didn't listen to him. Um, and I was like a film major, music minor. I was every art thing. And he was really concerned that I wasn't going to make money, but I didn't care because I just wanted to be happy. Um, so I, you know, I just went into it just wanting to write stories. And if people come up to me and say that they loved a book or it changed their life, that's, I mean, that's like the best part. I mean, money's cool too, but um, I mean that I, it's. But if you made better. no money, you would still write. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Do you guys want to talk about money? I would definitely still write. Um, and I, like Nan, I, to me, was the, just being published and seeing my name on a book is really what. And I, I have, going back to your being surprised question, when you go to a cocktail party and someone, you know, finds that you've published a book, I mean, it's like, I think it's the most amazing thing ever because everybody wants to write a book and it's yeah. hard, you know, to actually do it. More so now than ever, I think. Like just when you go to a, a cocktail party and somebody asks, what do you do? What do you say? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the people, whether I tell them I do my real job or I just tell them I write. But I mean, usually if I don't say I write, my wife adds that in and people are like, ooh, but do what you, do you ever, write? And, but do you yeah. ever say I'm a writer? Um, I do sometimes, yeah, okay. for sure. Uh, so having been in education for 16 years, I also did not go into this for the money, um, even though I could absolutely be paid a lot more. Um, but I, for me, it was always a goal when I went into education, high school teacher, I'm doing something else in ed right now, but my goal was to move to higher ed, be a professor and write on the side. So now I'm stuck in public education, being a writer on the side. And for me, the goal would be to be able to work part-time and write, give, devote more time to my writing, because I feel like if I had more time and energy to focus on my writing, I could do more of what I actually want to do with writing, but I'm stuck in this single, I own a home. Like I have to pay for my life somehow. And my uh, writing royalties are certainly not going to cover that. So I'm stuck in my full-time job. Do you mean write more or write a different kind of writing? both? Both. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you know? What uh, different kind of writing you would do? Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do young adults. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's a small side of historical fiction I'd like to tap into as well, but I just I do not have the time to do the research part for that. So, yeah, treading water. Okay. So. Um, I think uh, most of you have kind of answered some of the questions I was just going to ask, which is uh, you would still write just to get that book out into the world, right? Is there anybody here who would give up writing? Is there, do you, do you agree that it's impossible not to write? You all agree. Everybody agrees. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so here's what I want to ask. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't agree with that. Um, I just went through a really significant dry spell for about six months or so, and I didn't hate it. Um, but, but now that I've picked back up, I'm like, oh yeah, right. You do love doing this. So I think for me personally, if I spend a certain amount of time not doing it, I get used to it, to not doing it. And it doesn't feel terrible, but as soon as I push myself back into it, I'm like, yeah, this is what you want to be doing. So. Okay. So, um, this we're talking about expectations and reality. Okay. So do you think we've covered that? Cause what I want to ask is how do you feel about your, what is your current reality and how do you feel about it? That's a really loaded question. Like in this room, I'm very happy. You know, this is a lovely reality to be in right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll be tongue in cheek about like one of the first things that came to mind when it was this, this was sort of the title of the panel. So like um, a reality that I didn't expect or think about. And if anyone here is thinking about writing or putting yeah, their work out into the world, yeah. is that if you choose a pen name, people are going to call you that and you have to like answer to it. So like, just know that going in because Aurora Ray looks really good on paper, but sounds a little bit like the Roar Juror if you're a 30 Rock fan. <laughs> So um, a little tongue in cheek, but also a cautionary tale. Okay, thank you. This is the same question for everybody, so. 
All right. <laughs> well, my my current reality is is pretty good. I, actually, it's it's very good because, uh, like I said, I stopped teaching. I I'm a new New York City public school teacher, and I have five years that I can be away from it before I lose my tenure and seniority. So I'm taking this time now and devoting it to writing. I'll probably have to go back to teaching, but at the moment, it's great that I'm not teaching. I'm enjoying the hell out of it. Anybody else have anything to say, please? <laughs> yeah, well, my reality is right now I'm not getting down as many words as I like because I'm working two jobs. So hopefully that reality will change soon. Do you, do you have a word count for the day or something? If I can get 300 words down right now a day, I'm, I'm super happy. I mean, that's low, but no, that's, it's not. I, that's my reality no, right now. No, that's fabulous. So. In the last thing, we talked about getting one word down. And if you get stuck, right? Anything? No. Yeah. <laughs> that That's certainly the safest answer in this group. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to ask you guys if there's anything you want to say that I haven't asked you. And then we're going to talk to these guys out here. No, 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 no. Okay. So uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, let's start with Joni. On the last. So my question to anyone Particularly you, Ted, have you ever considered writing comedy? And I'm sure it's really hard, very difficult, I would think, but have you ever considered that? No, I haven't. I I think my humor comes from 15 years in a high school English classroom uh, where sarcasm is my main defense. So by default, I have to be funny because I have to entertain 16 year olds. Um, but no, I haven't considered it. I, I do think, um, actually I find writing humor in books difficult. Actually. I don't Ooh, know if anyone else can speak yeah, to that because yeah. I'm like, I think this is hilarious, but I don't know that anyone else will. Um, there is a scene though, and this is from GCLS in New Mexico. And I read a, an excerpt from golden hour and it was the first time I'd done anything like that. Cause I'm a pandemic author. My first but came out in 2020 of May of 2020. So yeah, I'm like uh, a little rough around the edges. So, um, but the opening scene that I read this woman, I will never forget it. She just busted out laughing. And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I'm funny. And it was That's like, great. it was such, it was such a fulfilling moment. And it was a funny section truly, but to have that kind of reaction from someone, that's what made it worth it. Um, so I do try to sneak some humor into my books, but I like, yeah, I, I love this topic. Anybody else want to talk about getting humor into their books? I just want to add, um, Kat, I remember that reading because that was the first time I met you. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to approach you at the bar because she seems fun. So I also thought it was funny. But no, I don't want to write humor because it wouldn't translate well. Would it, um, it just it wouldn't be funny. Anyone else like tricks for writing humor in your books or? I mean, I think sarcasm is like a really great vehicle for writing. And I try to add some humor into books, not full rom-com, but like in that in that direction, but you know, say what you will about one and two star reviews, like you get a little bit of distance. Like if you actually like write and perform comedy and that flop, like it flops like <laughs> really publicly and instantly and epic, like, no, no. It sounds like you've tried that. No, no. <laughs> Man, any um, comedy I in your books? I tried to put some comedy into my first book. Um, I don't know if anybody else thinks beavers are as hilarious as I do. Um, but at when I was in Provincetown, I did a reading and um, I got a laugh and it was the first reading I had ever done really publicly. And that it really was an amazing feeling to get that laugh. And Melissa Braden after it, she's like, so that was funny. Is it hard to write funny? And I'm like, it's really hard to write funny. <laughs> you knew you were writing funny, though, right? I was trying for it. Yeah. But but are there are you going to talk about funny? Why not? <laughs> I mean, are, uh, is there, this is like a technique thing though, I guess I'm asking, is there something that you want to avoid or that you want to do when you know that you want something to be funny? Sometimes you'll, you know, some, something's not funny and the whole crowd is laughing, you know? It's just super subjective and yeah. you just don't know what's going to hit and what's not going to hit. Or what to and avoid. Something like, that's funny is going to be funny for somebody else. Yeah, any, You just don't know. You just don't know. Right. Um, no technique thing like it's good to do it in dialogue or it's good to do it in in uh, uh, dialogue yeah. yeah i think dialogue and i think it's situational right like anytime you put people in on 
awkward and an uncomfortable situation, like that's kind of right. That's where it comes from. A yeah. chuckle. Like I, I, my favorite part of writing a story is the meet cute, but it's really like the meet awkward. Um, <laughs> and that like, that's always just kind of fun. So that's there are places great. where I think it fits pretty naturally. Excellent. That was a great question, Joni. Somebody. I don't know if I want to admit this, but for like the last several years, my reading has been almost exclusively writing craft and self-help. Wow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to elaborate. Well, yeah, <laughs> even though right. That's my reaction. I only read romance, um, but I'm going through like a writing slump. So I'm like back to my old self of just not reading, which is sad because I've started so many good books. Um, hopefully after I finish this next book, um, I will finally finish my TBR. But no, I mostly read romance. And I think it was Nan, you brought this up where you read and you're reading a story. You're like, wait, I should be writing. And then I get inspired to write a story. And so I go write a line and then they get bored of writing. And so it's a constant flip flop of reading and writing. Um, but because I get inspired by reading romance, I read romance to like, get me to my computer to read words. And it's just my favorite genre. You guys over here? Um, I read a lot of psychological thrillers. Uh, I could never, ever, ever write one. I don't think I have the capacity for that, but I, I'm a big true crime person. So that's like my little lean to, I actually don't read a ton of romance. I read a significant amount, I would say, but it's not my go-to that and contemporary fiction, I would say are my two big ones. Well, the question is, what do you like to see in your negative reviews? I feel like I can process the bad review if someone's like, it wasn't for me. And I'm like, okay, like it just brushes off. I've had most of the re bad reviews are like that, where they acknowledge that, you know, this is not my cup of tea, but it could be yours. And I'm like, that's awesome. Some of them, um, I guess I haven't had a lot um, of specifically bad reviews, um, but some, I mean, they have like one line and it hurts my soul, but that, but anytime someone says this wasn't for me, and if you enjoy this, 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 it might be for you. And that always makes me less fragile, I guess. A good question. Who else? Yeah, I think that like that's actually a really kind like three stars with like now anything mean is like that's a gift. So thank you for doing that. Um, <clears throat> I I, <laughs> um, I like to think I can sort of take the constructive criticism and even things like um, it's sort of ironic that like my highest rated books are like sometimes my worst sellers in the other way. Like it's just a weird like kind of the way it works. Um, but sometimes like people will say like they'll call you out for something like this seemed problematic for me and I'll like stomp my foot and be really cranky about it. But then I'll be like, yeah, if I just written like one chapter a little bit differently that I, I could have addressed that. And that actually makes me a better the next time. And so I, I don't mind when reviews actually call out some specific things that seemed problematic. You can tell very obviously if it's like a mean spirited thing or a like, I really thought about this and I, I'll never fault a, a thoughtful review, even if it's a negative one. That's excellent. Yeah, I, I agree with these guys. Um, this is not for me is a great way to respond to a book you don't really like too much. Um, I think what I what bothers me is the editorializing, like uh, their opinion um, kind of stated in a way that's fact. Um, she repeated this over and over and over and over and over and over. Okay. One over is okay, but the rest leave them out. Um, yeah. The people who get a little bit over the top with their vitriol, um, but you know, they are entitled to their wrong opinion. Are you guys on this side? I mean, just like these guys said, as long as I don't know who asked the question, yeah, but Corey over here. as long as you're thoughtful and not mean, Okay. Okay. Here's, here's a woman who doesn't want to write and gets bored. So that's good. How, how, who's got a remedy for that? I, I think it's just a matter of putting your butt in the chair and pushing through it. Even if you're bored, even if you're uninspired, even if what you, you hate what you're putting down on the page, just do it anyway. And I can't remember who said it, but you know, you can't fix a blank page. You can only fix something that's already been written down. Good question. This is where my lack of discipline comes through. Um, I am not a proponent of sitting your ass in the chair and forcing yourself to do it. Um, me personally, I can't do it unless I want to. So if I'm bored, 
I'm not, I'm not doing it. Right. I will wait until something else inspires me or I'll go for a run or whatever. And if, you know, if two weeks go by and I don't write a single word, I would rather experience that than force myself to write something that I don't like because I hate going back and editing it. So I would rather wait until I'm ready, but I know a lot of people don't agree with that, but that's what works for me. So, and something could happen in those two weeks. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really true. I think uh, writing sometimes is like exercise. Like you may not want to do it and you may not enjoy it in the moment, but you're almost always glad you did it after the fact. Uh, and so yes. unfortunately I'm better at that writing than exercising these days, but <laughs> I, I think it sort of holds true. So it's like, if you're not, if you're not happy with that's actually on the page, then it's time to like reassess your story. If you're just sort of bored with the process and you're at the saggy middle and there's like shiny new projects, like trying to get your attention, like that's just part of the writing process and you got to find a way to push through it. 